Recording. Boom. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Welcome to our conversation. This is Octavia's Parables in conversation with the incomparable Alexis Pauline Gums, the sister, the doctor. Um, and we are talking about um, Octavia E. Butler's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, which Toshi and I have just been in a podcast journey rereading um, from scratch <laughs> from the beginning. Mm. And we want to have some conversation around what we learned this time, what we felt this time, um, what we're applying this time. So I have like some questions. And if other people have questions, uh, which I'm sure you also have, um, you can use the Q&A box. And when it's time to like bring it to the audience, I will check the Q&A box. Um, generally, I can't navigate the Q&A box chat and the conversation. So the chat is just for y'all to have amongst yourselves. But if you really want a question answered, bring it to the Q&A box. Um, and yeah, if there's any other needs, access needs, just message the panelists and let us know and we'll figure it out. We're kind of flying wildly solo right now. <laughs> it's like all the people who might be able to help us are away on different various <laughs> journeys. Vacation. So, vacations, which are nest. You know, I was like, my assistant was like, can I have a, a vacation? I've been asking her to take a vacation for a year. <laughs> and she was like, I think I can do it. And I was like, I think you can. I know you can. So um, but it really feels different. I'm like, oh, how do we webinar? So, um, yeah, so that's, that's where we're at. Um, if you need us to slow down or anything like that, just let us know. And then we are recording this. The audio will go into our Octavius Parables feed sometime soon. And we're also planning to post the video onto YouTube or something else. Um, I'm not posting it live to YouTube right now because I, I, I don't know why we would. I don't know how anyone would find it if it was there randomly. <laughs> um, like, <okay. laughs> like, I don't know. So maybe we can do transcripts too. Exactly. Oh yeah, and it'll be transcripts yeah. transcribed because it'll everything in our feed is also transcribed onto readingoctavia.com. All righty. So we're having this basically a lunch break over Octavia with all of y'all. And my first question is actually, um, how are you, right? So this week we have wildfires, floods, droughts. We have coups, we have earthquakes. Everything is concurrently happening. Um, and we're alive inside of it, creating and in love and with our families, how are you? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. I, I'm very grateful to be with y'all. Um, I know my, my mom is in here somewhere. She was like, I'm gonna be watching. Um, so. Hi, thank you. <laughs> we love you. Um, yeah. And I mean, and she has listened to every single episode. Oh yeah. Often, often before me, like I'll talk to her and she'll be like, did you listen yet? Um, My mom <laughs> like somehow listens before we even record it. I like, I <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What she said, I know. <laughs> I'm like, no. It's like, this is part of my creation. I created you everything that you would then create. Um, <laughs> That's great. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling profoundly grateful mm -hmm. and I'm also in a little bit of a self, I guess I'm always in a self-guided writing retreat, to be honest, but I'm in a solo self-guided writing retreat because my partner is on a solo spiritual retreat outside of this house. So it's a different thing. And, you know, I feel like I'm in, I'm in the midst of writing this biography of Audre Lorde and she's, and, and I'm actually close to turning in the draft of the full thing. And she's like, oh, great, you're by yourself. So there's this, <laughs> there's this, there's this, and oh, make sure exciting. this. 
Um, and I love that. So I love getting to hang out with the clarity of my ancestral assignment. That's that's what I'm super present to today. And tomorrow is my little sister's birthday. So um, to, it's sister's Eve for yeah. me because it's yeah. like the Eve of the day that I first got to be a sister, which as you said earlier, is one of my primary identifications. It really is. So yeah, I'm feeling very, very, very grateful. And I'm sending a lot of love. There are these large things that are happening but there's also small challenges of, of people who I love that, that I'm aware of. And I'm just sending a lot, a lot, a lot of love to, to you and to everybody who's here, who's here with us. Yay. Welcome. Welcome, Alexis. All right, Toshi. Yo. My love. Um, I am, I am, uh, I, I've been having a very like tight, hot time. Yeah, uh -huh. like really, and I think it is the, you know, the blessing to be able to actually navigate some complexity in your own life, um, the yeah. currency of that, while so many things are happening. Um, and, you know, I happen to think the earth is often in an epic state of transformation, not always you know, wonderful and and um and and so often instigated by human behavior, out of line human behavior. But it is it is it is really depressing right now. It is just like I can't, I was like, it's this is just, you know, I just put my head down. Like I just uh, it's so unnecessary. And it's just like, no, just stop. <laughs> just stop. Like it's just if if humans just would do would stop and loved each other like right now, yeah. we still would have to contend with what we have done all these hundreds of years. And it really will take us all of our attention and all of our, you know, all of our everything. And um, it's really hard and depressing. And I'm just thinking on and activating what I can do to be supportive of you know, ground base and individuals who are, you know, on front lines, um, who are hiding, who are, you know, trying, you know, Haiti, like who are really trying to get, you know, that one inch further. Like, I think these are the people to reach out to and to support um, so that, cause that one inch matters. If somebody's trying to have one inch, it matters if they can do it. And then turn it and turn it and turn it and, and you know, hopefully get somewhere else. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C., where I grew up is a beautiful kind of torrential downpour happening right now. Yeah. And the windows are open and I can hear the rain. There's a lot of green trees I'm looking at. I'm with um, Alexis and Adrian, my family, and I am. And so I my heart is very open and wide and, and, and happy, you know, to be in this particular space at this particular time and gratitude mm -hmm. and support and love for everybody who is here with us and for everybody who will, will catch this vibe later on, like just a lot of love, gratitude to everybody. Uh, I love all those answers. <laughs> mm -hmm. I am, uh, on a wavelength with y'all like I'm like oh yep in the braid I'm in the braid I'm in the braid so um I just got home from my my first trip since moving here to Durham um and it was a trip to see my nibblings my oldest nibbling turned 13 mm -hmm. which is wild to me right because I'm like 13 I still remember your diapers which I'm like I have to stop saying that but I don't know when or if I will um but it was just like a delicious, like the level of intention that goes into traveling to see people I love right now is like, it's so intentional, right? It's like, we are testing and we're doing this and this and all the boundaries are acts of love. And it's, you know, so I got to see my nibblings and then I got to see my goddesses, one of whom is pregnant. These are friends of mine from college. And we just got to have a baby shower and just bless it up, bless it all up. So I came home feeling really full and then checked on the news. And I was like, you know, it just like pulls all the life out. And so I've been writing a lot, like something's coming through that's like, yeah, how are we 
spiritually moving through this moment with all these pressures. So I'm writing, I might post it today or tomorrow, but like something, if something is like, we, everything is falling apart. Everything is falling down. Most of it needs to fall down. And the detritus is knocking us all. And so I also think I get some solo writing time this weekend. I'm really excited about, because I do feel the difference as a writer of what happens when it's like, I think you're alone now. And like the answers are like, oh. <laughs> like exactly. <is> moment. <laughs> um, I always, you know, there, I don't know. There's that meme where the person's like, I can't even describe it, but anyway, <laughs> my nibbling only speaks in trying to describe memes. And I'm like, it doesn't work. <laughs> and yet, here I am. So all of that's happening. My tortoise is happy um, and big and eating a lot. And I'm learning a lot about shells <laughs> and like having a shell. So that's me. And I'm so, I can't believe we pulled this off all throughout the whole two seasons, Alexis, we kept being like, and then we have to have Alexis. <laughs> and like, then we have to talk with Alexis. Like we have to like do the show with Alexis here. And we just knew all along, like it won't be complete. We won't have done it until we get to have this conversation with you. So I love when stuff is two years in the making. <laughs> when, you know, when it's yeah. like a longing. It's like, we all talk all the time, but there was this particular conversation that we were really excited to have with you. Um, so I have questions. My first is, you know, all three of us are positively obsessed with this work of Octavia Butler's, right? Yes. Um, and it's a life force. It's a life-giving obsession. I agree. Like, yes. Right. And I think we've all read it multiple times, right? So this was not the first for any of us. Some of us have created whole operas out of it, <laughs> whole philosophies out of it, other things. So I wanted to ask, how was this reading for you, right? Like what felt new, what felt more sharp or more distinct in, in this time around? Yeah, you wanna go for her stuff, she? Oh, you're muted though. You're muted, my beloved. Dude, I'll go first because it's it's not very long. I it just I think we said this during the podcast. It was like I've read this a hundred times, and all of a sudden everything. I think in particular, parable of the talents. You know, it just the it just the the you know down in the earth, and it really is totally going to inform us coming back together with the opera because yeah. I just discovered. You know, I'm sure they're not going to let me just rewrite the whole thing. I mean, <laughs> that's what I. That's what I mean, aren't you like, like kind of? I am, but you know, I have I have partners and <laughs> in, in budgets and you know, yeah, have things. budgets. Yeah, but it 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 was it was like um, I don't know if you ever had this this thing, but you know how you grow up with somebody like a cousin or your aunt or like a neighbor, and then you're very tight at a young age, like you know everything about them. Yeah. And then you, and then you separate and then you see them at the cookout and you have this deep conversation with them. That is like a reveal of what you already know, but now yeah. you have all the, 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 like everything's and that's how it was. I was like, I was yeah. so familiar with it. I, you know, and, but it was just like a hundred times deeper than it already was, which is saying a lot. I love that. How about for you, Alexis? Yeah, I mean, it was so, I, I guess, especially with Parable of the Talents, what I realized this time is that it's so hard and there are parts of it that I repress. Yeah. You know, like I repress them as if they're my own traumatic memories because I can't hold them all the time. You know, like I, I can be present to them when I'm moving through the text and Obviously, Octavia Butler is moving us through the plot, but I can't ever remember, which is hard then because I read it again and I'm traumatized all over Every again time. like it's for the first time. Um, yeah, which is why I don't I don't read Octavia right before I go to sleep anymore. That's right. um, and and I would listen to I would listen to the podcast episodes like first thing in the morning. 
So like I would wake up and which, you know, whichever one had come out. So it's usually like Tuesday, if they come, they came out on Monday, which is why my mom's like, did you listen yet? Cause she would, you know, <laughs> she's like, like it's Monday. it would go live and she's in London. So like the day starts before and she's like, you know, on it. Um, <laughs> she's like, couldn't they just do it every day? Why do they have to wait a whole week? You know what I'm saying? Like she was just like, so you know, <laughs> reading, reading along and really ready for the conversation, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think there are a lot of people who are listening who are like, able to read these difficult reckonings because you two were creating this sacred space of holding where however complicated it was whatever it brought up for people they weren't going to have to only process it by themselves or navigate it alone you know and so i think that my mom was definitely one of those people who was like i'm reading this in community you know and and that means something um so, but yeah, so so I would listen early in the morning, like while I'm making my oatmeal and like whatever, like cleaning, cleaning my kitchen and getting getting clear for the day. And it was it was really powerful to be able to have those days guided by these questions, you know, to have um, whatever I was even gonna learn about the news that happened that day to actually already have this yes this container and that that was that was very different from from all the times I've read it alone all the times I've read it to write about it all the times I've read it to teach it you know like it it was a different ceremony and I'm really grateful for it yeah thank you for that I all of my new experiences with this time are related to time um like in the past when I've read it, it's always been like, you know, like I read very fast generally as a reader and part of how I do the same thing. I forget anything that's like, that was hard. <laughs> and so I just like, <laughs> like put it in the dissociation cloud that had my seven-year-old self created. And I'm just like, you'll stay there until I'm ready to read you again and like learn the lesson again. Um, but this time, because we were moving so slowly I couldn't, like, it was like, we're reading one chapter a week, maybe two, you know? So I had to really sit with what happened here. Like I couldn't speed past the hard chapters. It was like, you have to really get in the nitty gritty of them. So that aspect of time, and then having, going through this reading while being in COVID and being quarantined for a year, right? So just the, the inconvenience of being like, okay, now you're in your home the sense of time, the time that everything took, like how long it took to walk that far, how long it took to establish Acorn, how long they were being occupied by the Christian, uh, you know, um, like the Christians, uh, <laughs> by Camp Christian, by how long they were occupied as Camp Christian, right? Um, like, I was like, oh, a year of that? Like it struck me so differently having lived inside of this past year. And, you know, there's years that are beautiful. There's years that are struggling, but I I do feel like something Octavia really had her finger on was how as climate change and as the catastrophes increase, time feels different, right? Like it feels urgent and precious and overwhelming. And you know, I'm like, yeah, this is the closest we've ever been to the story itself in time. So, you know, when I read it a decade ago, that was a really different experience from, I'm like, Lauren Olamina is alive right now. Like this person is 12 <laughs> and all of that, all those aspects of time felt really different. And um, the suffering felt more because of that, like reading it slower, being in the time of it, it was like, I have to turn and face what she knew, what she was warning us about in a different way. Cause I tend, you know, my brain is an optimistic brain. I tend to be like, God is change. Isn't that beautiful? I'm like, change is hard. Change takes a long time. It's slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast. So all of that really stood out to me differently this time. And, you know, when you talked about that, that traumatic forgetting, what the next question I had is, are there parts of the story that you had forgotten? And what are they? Um, and I can answer first on this one, which is the, I think the biggest thing, you know, I, I mostly 
I knew that I forgot what happened during the occupation of Acorn. I always forget it. I want to forget it. But the thing that I really had forgotten this time was Marcus. Um, like what Marcus did and how unforgivable it is, how, how there's no justice for it. There's no closure for it. So, you know, this idea that your sibling steals away your child, raises that child. And then that when such that when the child finally meets you, they're still like, that's my parent and not you. That's the person I roll with and not you. And for the rest of life that, that goes on, oh, you know, that struck me really differently this time possibly because I am a sibling of a sister. You know, both of my sisters have children <laughs> in their lives that I'm like in love with. And I'm like, oh, I can't even imagine the betrayal of taking one of their children from them for any reason, for any belief, <laughs> you know? Um, and then not really ever apologizing for it, like not really ever accounting for it, not really telling the child like, my bad, I fucked up, you know? It was just like, this is, this is the lie and we're all gonna live in it. So that part landed for me very differently this time. And, and it made me, um, it made me think about the male ego in this time and what patriarchy is doing to it and how I see so many men around me behaving horrifically. And these are men that I loved. You know, these are men that I've known. These are men that I cared about. Um, I care about their souls still, you know, but I'm like, oh, I see that this thing with patriarchy, which I don't know that Octavia would have understood exactly what was happening with that. But to me, that's how it feels in this moment. It's like, oh, so much is being taken, or at least men perceive like so much of the mythological supremacy is being taken. And that ego is leading to such acts of violence and, and really endangering children. <laughs> so all of that stood out to me in a different way this time. What about for y'all, things you forgot, things that stood out to you this time? I think I always compress the time in Acorn. Always. So I always, I'm, I'm always like, oh, this is horrible takeover. They were brutalized. They were, then there was a mudslide. And then it got like, <laughs> like it's almost like in one sentence, in one breath, I'm like, and then there was a mudslide and finally they got, you know and it always just blows me away that they survived under those conditions of intensified violence and complete captivity for a year. Yes. And I mean, thinking about it this year and like what a year is, right? And how it can feel like it can feel like the same COVID day over and over again, you know, during quarantine. But then, you know, I'm starting to like, or even just in pictures, you know, like I see the kids in my life, my life, and I'm like, a year yeah. is such a long time, right? And so thinking that at the same time, all those people's kids were taken away, yes. those kids are experiencing a whole developmental year yeah. in Christian America captivity, a different form of Christian American captivity. It's a lot. That's a, that's a lot. And so I, 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 I know I condense that whenever I'm telling myself what the story is in my head and remembering it. And then I would say the other pieces, I didn't, her going back into that context, right? Like her going back into Christian America institutions to try to find her kid it's like, you know, in my head, I'm like, and she, and she really tried, she tried to find Larkin and, and, and that, that happened, but, and you, and you all held it in such a powerful way. It's like, she had to go to the house of her rapists, her abusers, her the people who killed her love, you know, and stole her kid. Like she had to go in through their door. Yeah. And, um, what does that, what does that mean? You know, and I, I think about it in, in the context of some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of, you know, transformative justice, like there's this impulse to be like, okay, I, and I can't go there and I won't go there. And, you yeah. know, just like th this, this idea of separation and it's all entangled. Nothing is that separate. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like she had to go through that door as part of her healing journey. She didn't get the intention that she wanted, which is to find out where Larkin was, yeah. you know, right away. But that's where her love took her. Yeah. You know, and her and her commitment and her her seek her seeking to um restitch, you know, what had been torn apart by this, by this horrific violence. So yeah, that that really struck me differently this time. Um, because the way that I think about, I, I remember the trajectory in my head is like, and that was horrible and it was horrific, but then they went on the road and then they found those nice people's house. And then they told everybody about earth seed and then they created their own institution. Right. And, and I just skip over the fact that she had to actually yeah. go and live and eat and listen in, in those spaces that were, you know, controlled by people who she, she knew not only knew they would harm her, but they had already harmed her in every possible way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciated Parable of Talents more than I ever appreciated it. You know, I read, read them both really close together the first time. And, um, and the and so you know, parable of the sower is devastating, but it's like a kind of an up note, a difficult up note, but an up note, like oh, and this here's a continue. I was devastated, full <laughs> of talents. Like I was like, what? But I did, I, I just did. It just didn't really, actually. I feel like I just realized it from having to do my like my part of the. Um, <laughs> podcast as I do the summation. So I, I read every chapter the day of the podcast that we're going to do. Yes. And when we were doing, we do two at a time. When we were doing three, it was really intense. Like I was like, I don't, I, I was like, can we just do two? Because I, can't handle so it. I, <laughs> I couldn't handle it. And, and so I read it. I like have three hours that, not, that, you know, I can't be booked before we do the podcast. And so that I can like, just go in there and then I, then I was like, <gasps> like, it's such a universe. She, she does this thing with time. Like I just never got, you know, just never got, I never got the, the, the thing about Larkin, you know, telling you the story. And then, um, Lauren shows up at some point and it's like, you're now you're in now, like you're, but before you, she's like, I'm in the now, but I'm taking you back, but I'm traveling while I'm in the now. So she isn't like, this is all one day or this is one three months. She's actually moving through her life as she's doing this as one would do if they were writing you know, a, a paper or a book or whatever. And so is Lauren Alamina. Yeah. But the, the times are not the same. They're not aligned times. They're like, they're like this, you know? And yes. I was just like, what? And yeah, I think on the last one I said to Adrian, I was kind of like, what time is it? Like, you know, what's yeah. going on? It was, it was such an incredible gift. And I think it's like the, you know, how she put us in such misery on such so many levels. Like, you know, earlier in it, I actually was like, oh, Marcus didn't get anything he needed at any point in his entire journey. Yeah. Like, he just, in his whole life, you know, his, he, he never got it. Like he was kind of him and the two twins. They were just, he was the one that got the most, uh, other than Keith, yeah. a little understanding of who he was and, and all of this stuff. And I think she intentionally just like, like made to the point where making fun of it, the most beautiful child, the most beautiful man, the most amazing, beautiful man, physically beautiful, amazing, beautiful. You know what Marcus is? He's a beautiful, beautiful. He's the most beautiful man I have ever seen in my life like she wore it out yeah and I was like oh because he never got stocked on the inside yeah like at all and he needed it desperately and we you know so I really missed I really got it this time and you know and I also really got that the multiple levels of of communication yes and and how you know, Lauren was often not good at it, or she, or, or she just made a decision 
that it wasn't worth being put forward if it didn't come in a very particular context that she created, yeah. you know? And I think that in particular with the two young boys, but like with Dan and with, um, with Marcus, but I think with like that age of kids that were the age she was when she started Ursi, yeah, she, she wasn't so great with them. Like she didn't have a lot of room for them. And she, and I, and I was like, oh, this is so interesting. And just really, really missed it. And I like both of you, just the violence I couldn't tolerate early on. And this time I had, I read every single thing like in depth. And I was just like, it's so close and it always has been close to experiences that people face um, living on the planet today. And it was really difficult. Yeah. It was very difficult. And it made me realize how much I am not reading um, current and current room, current situations. I was like, oh, I'm doing the same thing I did. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not absorbing. I'm not detailing. I'm not, you know, I'm yeah. just like, something bad things are happening <laughs> yeah. I'm just protecting myself and from from the from the truth in some big ways like mm -hmm. yeah I mean I think there's I really appreciate that because it's like the truth of Lauren and the truth of the circumstances and the truth of the violence that humans do to each other um you know Lauren it, it's interesting because I was having a conversation recently with somebody about Grace Lee Boggs who is a mentor of mine and he was also a very like complicated human being who had a lot of different human behaviors, you know, and was by some perceived as very sharp, very harsh. And that's not the her that I experienced, but it made me think about Lauren because I'm like, you know, you can put Lauren on a pedestal as a genius who figured all this stuff out. And you can also say Lauren was a human being who was hard and who made mistakes and who push people away when she wanted to draw them in closer and who was driven by her anger um, and, and other things, right? And so I really appreciated that this time around. And it shifted things for me. And I wanna know this question for you all is looking at the parables as a whole, um, you know, they're written, especially the first one, it's like, okay, Lauren is our protagonist. We are with her. And then for the second book, it's like, okay, we're in Larkin's voice, Larkin's place, and also visiting Lauren's journals. So it's really like, which of these characters do you identify with? Mm. And I'm curious for you, if you identify strongly with either of them, or if there was some other character in the series that this time appealed to you, that was like, oh, I can see myself in that character. Um, so is there a particular character that you related to this time and, and why? I really related to Larkin um, and I, and I do because, you know, secretly, you know, the first idea for me being in the opera was like, what if you were Larkin? Like, what if you were a spirit Larkin, you know, somebody who, who, um, you know, goes, goes in and, and, um, and dives in down. And I, I really couldn't do that um early on I mean it's such an interesting idea yeah um but like I said I was still in shock that I was in the opera at all <laughs> so I was like, yeah. I'm not having a part you know like this is like, let me be Toshi like you know but what I did do is I I I made the talents which is like the three you know entities um and that the destiny is to take root amongst the stars and the talents are the evidence that we took root amongst the stars yes um, and they come back, they come back to witness, come back to witness and help tell the, tell the story. That's, that's our, that's our vibration. And it's why we, we enjoy being a part, singing the story. And then we yeah. have moments when we're outside of the story, Yeah, you know, but I, but I actually didn't realize how much I appreciated that character again, like this time, but I, I resonate, I resonate with her and I, I had, hate to say it, like, I really resonated strongly with Marcus. Like I was just, you know, and he did terrible things um, to his sister, but he just had a horrible, horrible, horrible journey. And yeah, it, it's the one where I just was like, it, you know, when we read like what actually happened to them, yeah. I was just like, he could just could have died. Like 
Yeah. What, you know, sometimes you're just like, I just could have, that would have been okay. Yeah. Given the, the path that y'all are offering me. Yeah. And it's just, I just, I just felt it. And I feel that, um, that, like, what do you do with that? Like, I just felt that, that, you know, even at the worst, even I think he's responsible for acorn and enslavement of his, his relatives and people. And, mm-hmm. you know, and that he just like, you know, stole his sister's child. Like he's responsible for all of that. Mm-hmm. But I kind of, kind of don't see how he could have gotten out of where he was. I was like, well, then what, 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 how sh- would she write that? Like, what is the, you know, like, so after the, he's been a, like, what's the, how could she write that? And you see when she's writing, like some of the other things that hard things that people have, have gone through, you know, um, Justin, right. Yeah. He just, he freed himself. Yeah. Like he got, a, he's, he's, he made it like as a kid. And even, yeah. um, I can't remember the, the, the character that Lynn that she ends up with, like walking with at the end. Oh yeah. Like it's, it's these simple things. This mm-hmm. happened, this happened, and then they fell asleep and then she ran away. Like, you know, so it's like, I Mark said like, no, you know, he, he had the collar. He had no, like somebody made a mistake and he was able to crawl off in the night. That's like right. he, had, he had no way to escape. Yeah. He had to be bought by his sister. Like, so I just I yeah I resonate with that I really hope to never experience any path but I could just feel it very deeply yeah Mm. yeah what you just said Toshi I mean he had to be bought by his sister I mean we we know this but I, I think about I'm thinking about the whole story you know of like of black men and black women, you know, like what, what um, I feel like there's generations of black women who feel like they're being punished for saving, for saving black men. Um, and I'm just like, I came through, I, I don't, I'm not having that particular experience um, in this, in this incarnation, but just to say that, like what, when someone has to save you, Mm-hmm. What are the what are the forms of resentment? What are the forms, especially in patriarchy? What are the forms of punishment? Mm-hmm. What are the forms of um, shame that that are there? Wow, that's really that's really really powerful. I didn't think about it in that way mm-hmm. until you just said that. Um, who I identified with? I mean, it's interesting because there there is this intergenerational thing, and in in a way. I identify with with Larkin, um, for, but also I'm like Toshi. You are Larkin in the opera. I, I was like, oh snap, Toshi was Larkin the whole time. <laughs> All along. Like plot twist. <laughs> I was like, now we have to watch it again immediately. Immediately, I'm like thinking back on every time I watched it. Like the archivist. Wait a minute, the daughter. Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Okay, so that just blew my mind because mm. I, I don't. I think that that still happened. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. it still happened. Um, so I'll say that. But <laughs> Baba Olamina, mm-hmm. like Lauren Marcus Keith's father, yeah, Corey's husband. Yeah. Um, I think about him a lot, and I identify with him because he's our real contemporary. Yes. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the person who lives through more of the overlap time of what we are living. Um, And I'm like, yeah, he has a lot of faith in the people to get it together. I identify with that. Yes. He is interested in bringing back ancestral names and practices Mm -hmm. to his community. I identify with that. Yeah. He holds Sunday services, you know, <laughs> like at his house. My partner and I literally do that, you know. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so there were a lot of times where I was like, oh, if I really think about who I am in that story, 
I really, I think about him. I think about him a lot and, and what, mm. you know, what happens with his children, they take such different, they become him in such different ways, each of mm -hmm. them, right? Because you see the rage that Keith takes on. You see a particular form of Christianity that's not the form of Christianity that he was preaching in his living room, but that Marcus takes on this extreme version. Mm -hmm. And then you see Lauren being, being a leader, a, a tactical and spiritual leader in a, in a different way also. So I think about, I think about that because I think that the time of this, because the time of the, of these novels is immediately after our time that we're living in, it's all evidence of us. Mm. We have had the opportunity to impact it the whole time in, in whatever ways we've been impacting it. Yes. If, even if we don't live through the whole timeline, you know, to, to Earth Seeds um, launch into space. And so I identify with him and I very much identify with Larkin as a person looking through the archives, trying to make sense of something that she didn't get to experience. You know, I, I think about that like, oh, Larkin is sitting here reading the journal entries that her mother was writing when they were at Acorn. She didn't get to experience Acorn yeah. except for like a few months. Yeah. Um, that's how I feel. That's how I feel when I'm reading this stuff about the Kambahi River Collective. I'm like, yes. mm -hmm. you know, I'm reading about the Black feminist retreats and different people's letters and different people's journals and like, what would it have been like? Yes. And, you know, they did, they did it for us. You know, they did it for, for me and my generation. Similarly to Acorn, like they, they, were, they felt they were creating something that even if it didn't last for generations, they were still doing it in, off, in a futuristic offering. Yes. Form. And so I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm constantly kind of like belatedly eavesdropping through my research on these futuristic offering forms mm -hmm. that, um, that are so sacred, that are so sacred. And what happened in most cases does include state violence. It does include um, betrayals. It does include forms of harm um not necessarily in the, in the sense of like being being in captivity in the way that Christian America imposes onto acorn but but you know there, there's still loss there yeah and so I I, I relate to that um Thankfully, I was not raised in a household that feared black feminism, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and thankfully, you know, I was I was raised with the books of the black feminists surrounding me and, you know, a mother who felt empowered by by that work also and um and a father who was confused and then he was like, "Oh yeah, me too. I'm a queer black feminist too." You know. <laughs> so, um, she explained it to me. <laughs> right. It's like that that That'll yes that um so I'm, I'm grateful for that because unlike Larkin I didn't it, it, it there's no conflict of interest in really mm -hmm. celebrating that work and yeah. wanting to recuperate it and and look at it I, I um but it does put me in the position to say oh wow what would it what would it feel like to be looking at it trying to piece it together, eavesdropping it and feeling profoundly excluded from it. Yes. Which is like the inverse of what I feel. I feel profoundly included in it and mm -hmm. profoundly um, just blessed by it. Yeah. But for her, it's like, this is how I lost my mother. This is how I lost my right. safety. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah, so so Larkin, Larkin's grandfather. I'm like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like I'm I'm toddling between people. between yeah. them. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I like that we have two Larkins in the in the space. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, it's in it, it. This reading was different for me because it's always been Lauren for me. Like it's always always been Lauren. I am like since an early age walking around with an entire belief system prophecy in your head. 
that's me like sitting over on the side writing about going to space that's me like <laughs> yes verses to get through the day like got it you know just sort of like <laughs> you, dance it. you can't be my boyfriend got it like all of that you know I'm just sort of like yeah I I've always especially parable of the sower Lauren really been like oh like we have to find a way we have to find a way this time I was like I've aged out of being able to identify with Lauren, um, like aged out and bodied out. Right. So I'm just sort of like, I can't be the Lauren. Like I can't be the Lauren now. If, if Lauren's storyline occurred right now, like I would not survive it. I can't walk. (laughs) I can't run. I can't, I don't think I could survive that year of captivity. Um, like there's so many parts of it that I was reading that I was like, no, I wouldn't have made, I wouldn't make it through any of these things. And so it meant that as a reader, I had to look for like, who are the other people in this that I could identify with? Who are the other mm-hmm. characters in this that I could identify with? And I kept looking and being like, no, it's not really, it's not really Keith. It's not really Marcus. It's not really Harry. It's not really, you know, like I just kept being like, who, who, who? And it wasn't until the very end of the talents where she runs into, um, there's three different people, the Isis, uh, Isis Duarte, the, who is 43. I'm about to turn 43. So she's like a 43 year old woman living on her own. Um, and it's kind of like, come on in, <laughs> you know, come on in, let me help y'all. It's a little seductive, you know, I was like, that could be me. Um, and then the El- Elfords, I think is the other, it's like this couple that's like, we have a home, we have a guest house. Somehow we've managed to like keep some space here that we're listening to you. We believe you and we want to affirm your vision and like make room for people to come through and be here. And I'm like, yeah, I feel like I'm in that phase where I'm like, okay, like I'm fine. I'm trying to, you know, I've I've come to the sanctuary of Durham and I'm like, how do I build, you know, how do I contribute to the sanctuary space that this is? Um, And it felt good to see those characters finally and be like, okay, they also are living through the same time. And in the same way, like right now, there are movement movement comrades of mine who I'm like, they're on the front lines and I'm not now. I was, I was, you know, I, I was like, how can I run up and fight next to you? How can I facilitate right where you are whatever? But I'm really, I'm like, oh, I've stepped way back to this other place where I can be and hopefully still be an offer. And I felt so grateful because I think in the past too, I've always been like, get on with it. Let's go to space already. Like, why are you adding 20 <laughs> characters at the end? Like, look, you know, just go to space. Um, you know, Virgo nature. And I'm like, can we light the rocket ship up? But this time it felt like, oh, it's actually so important. I, and I think I said this when we were recording, I was like, this is the most important part <laughs> in some way is moving away from the the dazzle of her brilliance into the mundane work of Mm -hmm. building relationship in a living room right sitting together over tea and just being like here's my belief and what do you believe Mm -hmm. and who are you and how can you contribute to this and everyone can contribute Mm -hmm. to this and everyone has a role to play and most of it is not running up a highway um so what's your part um and it really resonated with me I was like okay and Toshi I think you and I have made this joke a number of times so we'll be like we'll be the rear guard just like you know <laughs> like you guys run and we're gonna stay here and be like they went that away or whatever you know just like <laughs> obfuscation and protection um with our like walking sticks and we'll just be like no nah, you know um and I was like yeah and we'll be home you know we'll provide ideological home spiritual home sanctuary home and I'm I'm glad about that actually I'm like oh I'm glad there is a role for me in this text (laughs) I want to be a part of this um and and I want to be a safe zone you know like in in my being I want to contribute to that um Mm. for the Lauren Olaminas right and so I have a lot of young people in my life um who I'm like, oh, you could be Lauren Olamide. <laughs> you know, like I definitely look at the children in my life with way too much expectation eyes. You know? So have you um, invented a relationship? <laughs> I'm just, whenever you do. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm here for it. 
has the word destiny started to resonate for you? <laughs> like, you writing in any journals? You know, every time they write anything down, I'm just like, brilliant. That's so brilliant. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask y'all this question of like, do you have Lauren Olaminas in your life? Like, do you have any potential Lauren Olamina people in your life right now? And what do you think they need? Like, what are you trying to give them? What are you providing to them or to their parents or to, you know, like, what do they need from us? Mm. You want to go first, Toshi? Sure. Um, you know, I come from Bernice Johnson Regan Scholarship. Yes, you do. University. Um, and she told me a long time ago that if I didn't have, um, you know, as you get older, multiple um, people around me who were actually bothered me a little bit that I wasn't actually doing my, my job on earth. I, sh I should be able to be replaced like in iterations of multiple generations. Mm. So she's like, so that way, whenever you die, it's going to be fine. You know, yeah. like, that's her thing and and she's like it's not that you like you know get them and mold them into something it's that you like you are like you know I just say I'm a tree and I get like really just try to be a tree that somebody would pick off what they needed and discard what they didn't yeah so I started doing that when I was, you know, and, and I realized like, this is how I was raised. Cause I started very early, you know, 13, 14, like I'm going to mm. be a producer. I'm going to be a musician. I'm going to be that. So I know the people, Judith Castleberry and June Millington and Nona Hendrix and who were like the trees for me. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I've, I've done it and, and it's kind of amazing because if you stay alive, then you, you know, like there's people in their forties and that, that I have been working with like their entire lives and they do, they bother you. Like they really don't do shit the way you did it. And then, and you really like, you know, mom's like, they should bother you and they should take things from you yes. without permission mm -hmm. and then like do something with it. And you can see yourself in it. And you just really just sit there and just, just be like, well, should I, pay a bill this month should I you know what can I do to support this or what can I you know yeah. or you just stay out of their way you know but eventually they're just telling you what to do in a certain kind of way like they will implement you in a system or they'll discard you you know and, they, and they'll walk right over you <laughs> she gave me all the information so I've seen plenty of you know plenty of of Lawrence and, and had my hands on the backs of a few. And, um, and, and I really see how that system works. Yeah. It, you know, and some people have found me and I, but I have like, I made it a point um, to make sure that I was like late teens. Yes. You know, and then I kind of stopped, like, as I got older, I was like, okay, you know what you 45 I'm not <laughs> like I've kind of I've kind of stopped and now it's the 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 10 year thing stopped but the like you know reaching for the the um the Lawrence or whatever they want to call themselves in the universe yeah it's, it's an incredible practice I'm like I have it <laughs> yeah you about to say you go ahead go ahead oh. I, yeah, I agree with that so much. I do feel like I see so many visionaries who are younger than me and I'm so grateful. Some of, some of whom I've like seen get here, you know, and be like, this is my purpose. Yeah. And I got here with it. And what's helpful about, you know, the question of what do they need is like, they're really, really good at being like, I'm gonna need this. <laughs> <laughs> and this, address me in this way acknowledge this about me you know like really and it's a it's amazing for me because you know I think of myself as a liberated you know spirit and uh, and and all of this but I'm like oh wow 
I would never, I would never even admit that I needed that. I would never ask for that. Yeah. You know, like I, I have had whole stories of like, don't, don't ask people for stuff <laughs> or, you know, like, like just, and not because I was, I was experiencing deprivation and not because I was, you know, raised by parents who refused to, just because yeah, it was like, I don't know, some kind of story about strength that I bought into that was a false story. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not random. Obviously it's capitalism. Anyway, that, that there's a, it was meant, it was meant to happen, but yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I, I think that watching people a, like 10 years younger than me, watching how they identify themselves, mm -hmm. watching how they, um, I mean, it took, it took me a long time to understand that the aspects of my being that some people would see as a liability or a weakness were such incredible portals of strength. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I see people coming into that sooner and sooner. Yeah. You know? Yes. Um, and I feel really grateful for that because mm -hmm. it's true. You know, it's, it's true, really our vulnerability and what we need and what's in flux about us and around us. It's so important to be able to share that and be open to that for ourselves and, and in community. So, so yeah, I think that I would say what the Lauren Olaminas around me, what I hope that I, I hope that I can, you know, try to, try to keep up, you know, like by letting go of the things where I'm like, it's such an incredible opportunity to be like, oh, okay, you're doing something. I would never do that. Yes. Right. Why wouldn't I do that? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, now I can let that go. You know, <laughs> like now I've now I've seen I've seen that model. It's mm -hmm. it's um it's it's letting them actually lead us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um and I and I do mean that organizationally, and I do mean that I, I mean it in every way, but mm -hmm. the way that I that I know I'm really being called to focus on is to let them lead me in my unlearning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, um, mm. because yeah, lay, <laughs> lay it all down, you know, as yeah. yes. Toni Morrison said, lay it all down, sword and shield. And yeah. I'm like, I didn't even know I had this sword in my hands. I didn't even know this whole thing was a shield, you know, <laughs> um, until you walking around without it. And I'm like, oh, I can lay it down. Right. So yeah, I, I think that, I don't know if they need that yeah. from me, but they deserve it for sure, for yeah. sure. And so, yeah, just to honor, honor that liberation by allowing myself to be led in that way. Mm. I love Come that. On. I love that. Well, and I, I love it too, because there's a, what I hear and what both of you are saying is surrender. And mm -hmm. I feel like there is a surrendering, um, you know, I, I think of Yoda, uh, in the Star Wars, one of the more recent Star Wars movies where it's like our job, our work basically, or we are what they grow beyond, mm. right? It's like, that's yeah. the good news. It's like, we are what they grow beyond. And so to recognize that it's like, uh, I am doing everything I can for my generation, but the good news will be that the next generation will go beyond me. And then the next generation will go beyond that to things I can't even imagine. Yes. And I think there's really, there's something that I think about, like when I look at how Lauren's father responded to her and how so many people responded to her with a no, with a mm -hmm. control, with a silencing, with a, um, there's no way you could know that. There's no way your thoughts could really matter up against all this reality and tradition and everything else. And what it has produced in me is that with the people who are, younger than me. And, and here, you know, I'm thinking, like I said, my nibbling just turned 13. So basically it's 30 years younger than me and 32 and 36 and, you know, and so on years younger mm -hmm. than me. It's like, whoa, how do I take you just as seriously as I take myself? Mm -hmm. You know, that like your emotional processes, how you're wrestling with belonging, what you believe about love in the world, what you believe about the climate and about policing and, and all this stuff is as important as what I think about them, right? And just because I'm older and have, you know, a different audience or a different education or whatever, it doesn't mean that I like know it more than you know it. And um, 
so it's like holding that in one hand and then in the other hand shaping, right? That it's like, also my job is to shape you, you know, like that's my work is to shape you with love mm. and belonging and to not have you feel like, oh, I love everything about you except this radical perspective you have, or, you know, I love everything about you except your most visionary part, you know, uh, which I think parents do without meaning yeah. to is that they're like, I love everything about you except the ways that you're trying to be different from me. What the fuck is that? You know, it's like, mm-hmm. that's the thing. That's the most important part of them is the part that's going beyond and that you couldn't have foreseen and that's truly original to them um, and allowed in the conditions. So, you know, one of my nibblings is really into Dungeons and Dragons and like, is like basically processing everything that happens in their life through this game. And I'm like, how do I take that seriously? That you're doing something in a game that is the most important, you know, that that's how you're processing the world. And isn't this a game, you know, and aren't there wizards and aren't there dungeon masters and uh-huh. it's all happening. Talk right? about it. I'm like, let me learn about this worldview and I have another (laughs) who's like everything is processed through songs and she's just making I mean she's singing all the time and she's just feeling it into songs and I'm like those are amazing songs (laughs) and like Mm -hmm. who knows maybe songs are the only way we're going to get liberated maybe we have Mm -hmm. to sing it like it can't be spoken you know and so Mm -hmm. I just with each of them I'm just like oh you know, how do I, how do I contend with it being just as important? And it really is helpful because the conversations I'm able to have as a create creative to creative, right. As I'm just sort of like, yeah, here's where I get stuck with my songwriting, <laughs> you know, or like whatever it is mm-hmm. and like whatever wisdom can come through them can come directly to me. Cause I don't have a block up that says yours is not wisdom and mine is, or yours is a lesser wisdom or something. I'm just like, you you came into the world with a destiny just like I did and here mm-hmm. we are in our different places in the experience and I want to make sure you feel the belonging of saying your ideas and saying your way and having someone say yes yeah yes mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think about the times in my life when something big came through me when I was young and I heard a no and I'm like I still made it to a big yes life You know, like I'm living a big yes life. I am doing that. Um, It's going to happen no matter what. But I'm like so curious. I'm like, what are the other big yeses that I could have received earlier? Because I had very supportive parents, right? Um, But there was no yes to queerness in the world that I lived in, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm so deliciously, fluidly queer. That's a huge part of my yes. You know, so with my nibblings, I'm like, you literally get to decide everything about you. <laughs> like yes. all of it, all of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Thank you for en- engaging the questions. For folks who are tuning in, who are with us, who are riding with us, I have a couple more questions that I'm gonna ask before moving into questions from the audience. Um, so if you have questions, now would be the time to drop them in the Q&A box. Um, and we're going, we have like another hour of time to be in conversation with each other. We'll go as long as it's feeling good and vibrant for us. Um, the next question I have is what would you like to tell Octavia about right now? You know, she was writing the parables in the eighties, seventies and eighties. She was ideating this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, what do you think she should know? Oh, I love that. Mm-hmm. Also, I have to pee. <laughs> so, should, we take a, should we take a bio break? Let's let's do Everybody that. Everybody just like five minutes of like stretching and peeing and watering yourself. I don't want to miss anything. We, oh, my won't, keep, we like, won't talk oh. without you. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Maybe I'll put on a song. Ooh. Yay. Yes, I can dance all put the way to the bathroom. Put on a song and we, oh, I know what I'll do. Hold on a second. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I know exactly what I'll do. Let me see if I can find it though. I'm putting on a song as soon as I can find it. Yay. And that means everybody can refill their water. Everybody, bio break. Yes, do their thing, stretching, whatever it is. Okay, well, the song will be on when I get back, but I'm going to go pee. I know, I'm trying to find, here it is. 
is y'all that I'm gonna put on. Two years ago, reports are circulating with evidence that dolphin mothers cling to their babies while they are in the womb, and for a few weeks after, so they can learn their name. Not only that, but according to the report, the rest of the pod holds space for that learning, quieting their other usual sounds so this can happen. Several loved ones have sent me the articles that share this information. And as a person whose mother sang and talked to me before I was born, it resonates. And interestingly enough, this new research was shared, according to the article, not at a meeting of marine biologists, but at the American Psychological Association meeting in Denver in August, 2016. The articles linked never mentioned the species of dolphin. This is something that it would feel so good to generalize. As mammals, it would satisfy a deep longing to be part of a practice of mother-child singing, community listening, held, named, held. Deep diving, as I often do, I learned that the observations leading to this insight about mother-baby clinging were observed in a specific context. Captivity. A mother dolphin who gave birth at the Oceanarium Dolphin Quest. From the pictures, I would say a bottlenose dolphin, but even the Dolphin Quest website doesn't name the species. It matters to me that this practice of singing, communal listening, was observed not in the open ocean, but in the confines of captive dolphin birth. I think of Debbie Africa, who gave birth secretly in prison, how the other women prisoners used sounds to shield her birth process, protected them from guards so that she and the baby were able to share precious time together, undetected for days. I think of Asada Shakur too, impossibly conceiving and giving birth to her daughter while a political prisoner mostly in solitary confinement, and how she listened to her angry daughter and the dreams of her grandmother when they told her she could be free, they could be together, and the community that made it real. I think of captive birth, which is an everyday occurrence in the United States of America, and in the U.S., the state shackles prisoners giving birth, takes away children almost immediately. What do they sing in the time of the womb? I think of the children of asylum seekers, separated from their parents in cages at the border. How does a chorus of grief and loss evolve to share crucial information? How are the over 5 million U.S. children with parents in prison, the uncounted children in cages right now, held, named? And I think about you and what you remember, what you keep close for as long as you can. I think about repetition and code and when we prioritize what communication and why and how we ever learn our names in this mess. And the need that makes us generalize and identify, become specific and vague. I think about the dolphin mother, Dolphin Quest staff named her Bailey and what she needed to say, her own name, in her own way, and what else under strict observation. If it was me, if it was you, I would say this in the way I could say it, in the too short time, in the high-pitched emergence. Remember this feeling. There is something called love. 
I would say, remember, there is something called freedom, even if you can't see it. There is me calling you in a world I don't control. There is something called freedom, and you know how to call it. Even here, in the holding pattern, here, in the hold, remember, remember, you are, you are held. Hello, so I definitely played the meditation and not the actual song and <laughs> no. good. I think it's what we needed. I was wondering, right? I was like, where's, I was like, where's my, it's like, where's the part where I was like, held. Yeah, I was like, it's okay. <laughs> um, so what just played for those of you who somehow might not know yet is um, a meditation of held that Toshi produced with Alexis reading from the book Undrowned. This little book right here, which Alexis wrote, which is so beautiful and sacred and always near me. And um, there's also a song. So they're basically doing the meditation and the song um, of this book. And they're glorious, glorious songs and glorious meditations and they're good for you. Um, and maybe, Oh, yeah, I band just, camp. Um, oh, I was about to say maybe yeah, I just put the <laughs> and on band camp also. Yeah. Yeah. So um did we have a good bio break? Yes. I needed. I'm glad I really we enjoyed that. that. I know. I was like, that's yummy. Um <laughs> hey, mom in the chat. <laughs> yeah. So hi mom. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you're fantastic. <laughs> so um yeah. What do we want to tell Octavia about right now today? Like what updates should she know about? Um, <laughs> I just, I had like one thing from the last exploration oh, bring it. we were on. Yeah. Um, they got a little time has passed. I don't know, but the, that conversation about like the Lawrence in your life. Yes. Um, it reminded me of, of um, Ben Cole um, because yeah. I was thinking about him like being, you know, what is he, 40 years older than her? Yes. And like very attractive following, and strong. <laughs> following, <laughs> following behind her on the highway. Like, you know, because they, they meet on the road and he's just kind of hanging close to the group and like, you know, kind of watching and seeing and doesn't really know. But, I, you know, in Parable of Talents, there's this like, amazing arc for them yes um where he's like we can't stay at acorn like we have to we have to go we have to leave and um and he go and he he tries to move them to another community yeah. that needs a doctor and that you know lauren could be a teacher and here's your house and they got indoor plumbing and they have their issues right they they about like by the water and things are happening and houses are falling and but they're like kind of a pretty tight community with some resources and she's so a no before even knowing no this is not going to happen but what I, what I was thinking about was the journey he takes to meet her which actually allows her to I think there's this part where she starts to talk about really like he's like not really what is this like, what do you, you know, I need to know. Like, if I'm like, because, you know, he couldn't leave when she was saying no, but then it's like, but what does staying mean? And she ends up saying like, kind of the biggest, most gigantic 
Earthseed statement that you actually hear in both of the series. Like, and then, and then it's written that she didn't realize that she, she hadn't actually really said it out loud to herself. And so I just was thinking about that relationship, like that, that, you know, a kind of a mentorship towards like, like he didn't have to ask that question. Like he didn't right. have, like he evolved to a state where he was like, I don't think this is going to work. Yeah. Like, I don't see us. I don't see it working here. Yeah. It's his child. It's his partner. He's terrified. He tries multiple times. He even gets her to go stay out there. He does everything he can. And then he surrenders. Yeah. Because he's not going without her. Yeah. But he could have just surrendered. But then he's like, tell me, tell me the story. Like, tell me how it works. Because I can't actually, you know, and she tells him this amazing story. Yeah. Which she hadn't actually even told herself. I just it's, thought that it's was also like how many times is that the way, right? Like this is why conversation is a liberatory tool. It's like, how many times is it like, I don't even know that I know this. I don't even know that I'm dreaming this. Mm-hmm. So I got to say it with you, you know, like, exactly. um, and how many people never find a good enough listener or someone who asked the question to let it out. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. It's just amazing. I remember early in the parable series, he's was laughing at her. Mm-hmm. You know, like you're just like, yes. really? That's what you got? <laughs> <laughs> the, the stars. Wait, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Cause he's like, I was a I was around for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of things. What this is what you got? Okay. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. thank you. Mm. Um, and do you have what would you say on on what you would tell Octavia now? What do you want her to know about? I feel like um I remember when she died. And um I found out so early in the morning. It was like 6 a.m. and um, our roommate, Dana, you know, gets up very early and listens to NPR in a shower. And I, so I was like one of the first people who knew of my community. Uh-huh. And, um, and I sat and looked at my like um, phone until it was 9 a.m. And then I called seven stories at 9 a.m. when they woke. And I was like, hi, this is Toshi. And who am I talking to about Octavia dying? And they didn't quite know who I was, but I, I ended up like, I have a relationship with them because of that. And I knew we were going to be like, I w- they didn't, they didn't have it together to do anything, but I knew we were going to be sitting in community around Octavia, like in a week, yeah. I was just like, and in a week we were at the grand cafe and Nona Hendrix and my mom drove up and, and we just piled into this beautiful small place and we did what we had to do. And I had the, uh, I had the, deepest feeling that she had such an awareness of our trajectory yeah and um I feel like I would be like telling her you was right about this and you was right about that and you was right about that (laughs) and I would be like but you know you didn't know about this this because this this actually exacerbates that which you did know about like you know I just try to explain because she has the net but to yeah. try to explain like really what's happening, like to, to like I mean, I hate for her to find out like people aren't really te- teaching children how to write, you know, with their hands, like <laughs> like you know that that was so important to her because she knew it was it was gonna go it was gonna be hard to get education, but to find out no, there's education. They just decided they didn't need to know how to write cursive. They didn't have to write this way or that, like that they sat in front of computers for you know a year and a half because no no one could innovate anything better than that like yes. and I just think I think she knew so much she was so forward thinking and yes and so I think it would be like you know confirmations and also just the things that you know when you first read about the collar 
And you're just like, when you first read about the collar, you're like, what, how did, how can you do that? And now with AI technology, you see how easy it is and it is you know, horrifying. Like, so I'd be like, no, it's, it's easier and sooner than you think. Like it's yeah. before her time, you know? Um, so I think yeah. that, you know, but what I would love to, to tell her is, um, would you, like to have a small gathering with my friends, Adrian and Alexis. <laughs> we promise there won't yes, be too please. many people. <laughs> and can we hang we'll out with for you? you? Yeah, that would be like the thing. I would just want to, I just would want to hang out and talk about anything. I uh, honestly I just, mm -hmm. I met her a, a couple of times and talked to her and it, it, I, that doesn't sound like an idea she would love, you know, honestly, like she yeah. wasn't but I would just I, I would try to stop smiling and just be like hey Octavia did, did you have lunch because like uh, Adrian lives right there and it's a big room and we won't talk to you too much you can enjoy food like you know, just <laughs> like, we'll just rub your that. feet while you eat and <laughs> yeah. um, yes you were gonna mess it up for us talking about rubbing her feet yeah she don't want that I was she like I want to rub on her <laughs> okay yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be Some smiling over there. Like, tell me she she don't be like chit chatting like that. <laughs> no, you'd have to go in first, Toshi. Like, yeah. I yeah. I'm already aware. <laughs> yeah, you could you could totally make it happen. Yeah, that would be my of thing, all people right? in the universe. Yes, oh, I would try. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it definitely resonates. I mean, and it's affirmed, underlined in the chat. Um. She's right, you know, like, it, so <laughs> the, uh, one of our, our amazing musicians, Spirit McIntyre, amazing artist, mm -hmm. has this ancestral gratitude song, and part of the chorus is just, you right, you right, you right, <laughs> like, that's basically what we're saying to the ancestors. <laughs> like, that's right. Right, okay, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a, it's humility, and it's love. I, I, in this time, you know, cause I've been for a long time, I've been reading Octavia since I was, you know, younger than Lauren Olamina is at the beginning of, the, of this work. Yeah. And I was always like, ah, you know, harsh. And like, and, and over time I felt like, I mean, this is the reason she don't, she don't want us to, to like be in her face, you know, like that she didn't really believe that humans could, you know, could get it together basically. Um, and so reading in her entire body of work, it's like either you're gonna leave this planet or you're gonna need to not actually be human beings um, in, the, in the sense biologically that we're thinking of it, of it now. Um, and, I, and I was like, but I feel like people can get it together. And, um, you know, she has come to me in a dream and been like, <laughs> you know, like basically just like laughed in my face um, yes. about that. And, <laughs> and across time I've thought about it and like, and, and then like doing more research and learning more about some of the things that she went through. I was like, I get it. I get how we might come to different conclusions about the capacity of other human beings. Um, because we've had different experiences with humans um, in our formative years. But now I'm like, okay. I mean, I, 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 look, at, I look at the way that um, Americans in particular are responding slash not responding to this pandemic and I feel like, and obviously all the things that are falling apart that you mentioned earlier, earlier in this conversation. And I feel like I'm witnessing a consent, like a consent within our species mm -hmm. to extinguish itself mm -hmm. and, to, and to not heal um, the pact and contract with this planet. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, you know, like that, that's, 
that's what Octavia was talking about. Yeah. And I, I held out at this, you know, I was like, but this, 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 this. And, you know, I think I've also gotten there in my own work where, yeah. you know, I, like I'm envisioning, I'm envisioning the future and I'm in collaboration with these future beings and they are not humanoid, <laughs> you know, like they, they are, mm-hmm. um, there's some kind of other aquatic, you know, like the, there's there's other things happening. And that's not to say that I give up because I don't give up. It's just to say that I'm learning something in this time about how whatever story we put behind it and whatever we say about it mm-hmm. and whatever judgments I have of it, because I'm very, I, I have to work through my judgments of people who are, um, who are, you know, trying not to have there be any mass in the schools where the babies are and none of them are vaccinated. Um, I have a lot of judgment around that. And I'm realizing that there's, and I, I mean, the, Amiri, I think what you're saying in the, in the chat is important. I'm not, I'm, I think there is something around leadership, but I do think that there's there's something about a, a large number of people buying into um, some obviously harmful behaviors yeah. that is teaching me something, you know. And and what Earthseed tells us is you have to you have to accept the teaching, you know. And and we do have to learn and adapt. And I can't necessarily be in denial. Like people are people are making these choices. They think they make sense. People are doing these things. They really are doing them. Of all the things they could do, that's really what they're what they're doing. Not just individual leaders, but like yeah. whole huge groups of people. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I can't dehumanize them by saying that they're just acting out of false consciousness. I have to understand that we are in a species together, and mm-hmm. I'm entangled with them, and they're entangled with me, yes. and and this is this is part of the reality. Yes, and so what it calls for me, and I, I guess all of this is just thank you, I love you to Octavia, yeah. is really getting that the depth of adaptation that we're experiencing. Yeah. Really understanding myself as part of a community mm-hmm. that doesn't privilege my own species. You know, like really understanding myself as a form of life and in, you know, as you, as you talk about it, Adrian, in, in the process of expanding biodiversity, yes. mm-hmm. that is change in a way that um, doesn't keep investing all the brilliance, hope and faith within That's human right. species. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I'm not willing to dehumanize huge groups of people who may be happy to dehumanize me, but I'm not necessarily right. willing to dehumanize them by saying that their actions are not part of what the species species code mm-hmm. is communicating That's in right. in the field of in the field of the planet. And yeah. so there's something very sobering about that, and then there's something so transformative about it. You know, yeah. there's there's some there's something it puts an urgency, you know, to the interspecies intimacy. It, it, um, mm. it requires, even though I don't necessarily think Octavia would be like, oh, Alexis, I share your spirituality, <laughs> even though, but she studied every religion she could find and, and yeah. think of and was very interested in like, how do people have faith? How do people organize their faith? I think that what it means to be a spiritual being, what it means to be a biological entity that spirit is moving through yeah. becomes so much more expansive when I'm not only a representative of this species. Yes. And when I don't understand what this species is doing to be the whole story of That's what's right. happening That's on right. planet Earth or in the universe. You know, so I think I would just be like, I get that part. I yeah. didn't get that part <laughs> before. Mm-hmm. I just now get that part. Like this mm-hmm. month, I get that part. And mm. yes, just, you know, to thank her for the bravery of holding space for that level of adaptation and change and other levels that I still don't get, you know, that hope that maybe one day I will. Yeah. Um, 
I'm really grateful for that. And mm. um, because her work has been in my life for so long, I feel like even though she's been like laughing in my face and like, you know, whatever, you know, like harsh and with hard edges, she's still been accompanying me through this whole thing and holding space for me to get that, you know, what I just got. So I'm, I'm just very grateful. Mm. Mm. I love that. I feel the same, you know, like I'm just sort of like, she's just a part of me, you know, like I, I don't think of Octavia as outside of myself anymore. You know, like I, she entered into my age, it's a, my life at such a formative age. And then she just has been the most persistent force, the most persistent questions, the most persistent teacher. Um, and I think, the, I think all the things y'all said, yes, you know, like you were right, you saw it all, like, you know, <laughs> great, um, we're awful, <laughs> you know, and, um, and like, I think for a long time, I was resistant, like my organizer hat would yeah, I'd be like, well, you know, sh- this is as far as she saw, but she wasn't an organizer. And so like, as an organizer, like, something else is possible. And I, I have had to really humble myself to like, mm-hmm. even as an organizer, um, even be- trying so hard to believe the very best of all people and that no one is disposable and all the things, um, we still have to just contend with our humanity. And I feel like she understood that in a way that is so tender. Um, and she didn't give us any characters that were superhuman. Um, even in her mm-hmm. other books when they are literally superhuman, but they're just not, you know, they're not mm-hmm. beyond the human flaws. Right. Um, the things that I would want to tell her are like, we opt into the collars, like we are opting in all the time to the control mm-hmm. and um, we're addicted to it. We're in it. We live within a very limited range right now. Many of us live within a very limited range of thought and risk, um, so worried about punishment, so worried about um, belonging, but we've opted in, you know, because that feels important to me that I'm like, oh, freedom is a choice, but it feels really daunting. And, and there's this other thing that feels like so yummy, even though it's just like wasting your entire life. (laughs) Um, So I want her to know that we are more prepared for this moment because of her, right? Like the factor that no one in the parables has is the parables, right? Like they they didn't have that text to refer back to and to be like, holy shit, (laughs) this is coming. And, you know, we've been, I've been just like, oh, I'm prepared for 2024. I am preparing for 2024. I'm in all kinds of small experiments. I'm thinking about it, you know, from when I started reading her, like 2024 was much bigger to me than like 2000. (laughs) It was much bigger than me to like 2020, Mm -hmm. like 2024 though. Um, So I, and I do think we are experimenting at scale. Like, I feel like the, the major message of the parables is this is not a mass and national scale kind of work. This is a really deep, intimate relational work. Mm -hmm. And Um, And I'm like, I'm committed to that. And I started to, Mm -hmm. you know, I started as an organizer, very much concerned with the US experiment and like, how do we change the nation and how do we like, whatever. And now I'm just like, I'm such a post-nationalist. I am living in outer space already, but we're just trying to figure out like how to, (laughs) like how to partner with the planet for those of us who want to remain here and can, um, Mm -hmm. how to be in that good partnership and how to be in a good partnership. I want her to know that like, these white billionaires are going to space and what do we, you know, like, I would love to talk with her about that. Like, what do you think about this? And, you know, is our orientation of like a big fuck you to them, the right orientation, or should we be trying to slide in those DMS and being like, you know, (laughs) send some money over here for the earth seed space station or whatever, you know, like I, I really am just sort of like, what would Lauren do in relationship to those things? Cause I know my response is very much like, how dare you go to space? But there's a, there's a small part of me that's like, without me, you know, like, so I'm just like, you know, <laughs> that wasn't what it was supposed to go, <laughs> you know? Um, so there's those things I would love to just talk with her about, but mostly it's just like the same gratitude. Just like, thank you for preparing us. Thank you for risking 
preparing us because you know when she was writing this people were just like what what are you talking about Mm -hmm. you know and I'm like yeah this is a brave thing ultimately as a very non-spiritualist she wrote a spiritual sacred apocalypse text yeah Um, I find it interesting and I'm going to pivot now into the questions we have and one of them the first one I'm going to ask just because it's here is was earth seed a cult why or why not? And if so, was that necessarily a bad thing? And we can do these rapid fire. There's like a lot of questions. So just whatever is top of mind, top of heart for you. I think that, I mean, obviously Larkin thinks about her mother as a cult leader, charismatic leader in a, in a particular way. And I get it, you know, I get, I get that. Um, I don't think it has that aspect of that people have to harm themselves or each other in order yep. to achieve the collective goal of the of the organization. So I think yep. that's an important distinction. I don't know. It doesn't seem like people are making the type of sacrifices that I, I, I think about when I when I think about. Um, Cults, and I don't think that people are being isolated from their families and communities in the way that that I associate with a cult. But I get why Larkin would say that it's a cult because her experience of it is complete isolation from her family and community Mm -hmm. and absolute harm, right? So like, I think she may project that onto the people of Earthseed because Mm -hmm. that's actually what happened to her. which, which I, which I totally get, but if, if it came down to it, I would say, I don't think so. Yeah. Now there, if there's some prequel expose earth seed member, you know, tells all that there's stuff yeah. that is not in the story that's happening. That's harmful beyond the, um, that's right. You know, that the mission to the stars that could be possible. Yeah. Cause that's possible within any organization, in my opinion, and any institution. But yeah. if I had to say yes, no, I'd say no. Yeah, I would say no too, and I I do I do think that you know, I know people who were in cults, and it's really that I don't know anybody who was like I'm glad I had that experience. Really, really hard, very violent, very manipulative, very geared towards like a particular individual who has like all power, no coming and going, no freedom, very isolating, um, and you know. But I think like any organization depending on how you, you create it, um, you, there is an opportunity to be, um, you know, really wonderful or really harmful. Mm. Um, and I think like our seeds, because it is a, a, a new spiritual, um, you know, collaborative organization that it gets aligned with, like when you look at other religions like Christianity, where everybody knows there's been lots of you know uh horrific violence and isolation and every ism that you can think of um you know under the under god you know uh-huh. so it's so i think it it, it can you know because i have a friend who's like th- thinks like the us that are like you know reading this and studying this she's like it's like y'all in a cult like and i'm like okay really watch it but you know it's oh. like <laughs> You know, I was, <laughs> so, you know, but I, I, I think, you know, I don't know the official, I, you know, uh, meaning of cult. I, it makes me want to look at what, how it's described yeah. te- technically, but I would say no. Yeah. And I, I would agree know. with y'all. No, you know, like the, I listened to the cult podcast for a while because when I first was putting out emergent strategy, someone was like, is that a cult? And I was like, let me go find out. <laughs> let me go like, yeah, let me, I, don't, I don't know. And the definition of a cult was like, it has a singular leader that um, everything flows towards. It is, it requires people to make significant financial, um, like whatever you have financially, you're supposed to contribute to that cult space. It is isolating from family and friends and anyone else who might go against what the cult says. Um, and it usually keeps fortifying itself into a tighter and tighter container. So mm. it's a really good podcast to listen to. 
um, because it talks a lot about actual cults. And in that regard, I don't, I didn't read Ursid as a cult, especially round one, right? Like the first round of gathering people, it was really, I felt like a group of survivors coming together with one person who was like, here's a, here's the destiny, but like, you have to decide whether you're with that destiny or not with that destiny. You can go if you're not. And um, that just feels like a belief system. You know, that feels like any belief system to me. As soon as you say you can go, you're not a cult. Cause yeah, <laughs> it's, no, I'm just saying, it's, it's no, you can go. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like there's a, like, there's also a guideline around like what sacrifice looks like. And like in the work, it's like, I would think of the, and I think this is important because I'm like, there's a difference in a cult and a community. And I think community is such a foreign concept for so many of us right now. Like we live these mm. hyper individualized lives yeah. that what Lauren was offering to people is like, this is a community. We have shared values. We all play a part in helping it exist. And we have, you know, a vision that we share with each, you know, like mm-hmm. those things. But I do think that that piece around agency, continued agency is important. Now, I do think it's a community where she could have done a better job of sharing leadership at moments. Mm-hmm. Right? And I feel like that's very common. Like if I look at movements today, that's the most common trait is that leaders start up and then really struggle with sharing leadership early enough for it to be meaningful in terms of shaping the structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really hard, right? When you're like, "What? Well, I'm hearing something. <laughs> you know, it's like, yes. And I'm sharing something, right? Um, thank you for thoughts on that. I, we have a number of people who have asked us about our writing processes. Um, so I'll, I'll uplift one of the questions, um, which quotes Octavia in Parable of the Sower. Lauren writes, I don't have all of it yet. I don't even know how to pass on what I do have. I've got to learn how to do that. It scares me how many things I've got to learn. How will I learn them? Is any of this real? So that's a quote from Lauren. And this person said, as a young person, this is how I feel about my writing and learning process. I have so much to share, but I'm so afraid. Where do you find the courage to write and share your work? And how do you stay open to learning? Mm. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that that, I mean, the good news and the bad news is I don't think that's just a young people (laughs) question. (laughs) Like, I love that quote because I'm like, oh yeah, that's how I feel every morning. I'm like, I have so much to learn. Yes. Is any of this even real? What, you know, like, like that, that's, that's kind of how I wake up. Like, that's right. what? Um, and that's, that's great. You know, like to, to me, that's, that's the, that's the generative, exciting thing. Yeah. I think for me, and I, everybody has their different practices around writing, but for me, it's do it first is do it every day. That's right. And what allows that to happen for me is that I don't say, okay, I got to do it every day, like eight hours a day. Yeah. But if, it, if it's only 15 minutes, yeah, just to sit in that and see what comes from that is any of this real blah, 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 you know, like see what comes from that yep. on a daily basis, because there, there is so much to learn and there will always, there will just be more, you know, that's the thing that, that I, that I have experienced and that elders have shared with me about learning it's not that there becomes less to learn after you learn some things it's just it just multiplies it's it's exponential yeah Um, something that helps me is understanding what can hold me in that process Mm -hmm. that I'm not just like floating floating out in the universe I'm actually gravitated to earth and what what that earth is for my writing practice um, can be really specific you know it often it's things that black feminists already said and that's grounding for me to be like okay I am in a what is this is any of this real I have so much to learn yes but right now I'm just gonna see where this one question you know by the great black feminist theorist Jackie Alexander yes. what this one where it takes me today and I'm gonna be fully present to that for for the part of this morning that I can that I can be present to that yeah and just allow that to guide mm-hmm. me and understand that it's um Though it doesn't become that there's less things to learn, my experience has been that I, I grow my faith in that practice by continuing to do it every day. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I would say is the, the, that beautiful position and those beautiful questions, that's exactly the reason 
yeah to do it I'm excited about what you're writing Mm -hmm. I know I'm like I'm so excited about Mm -hmm. that and like and the question is courage Mm -hmm. I also am a morning writer um I can write different times of the day and if if I miss the morning window and there's something that needs to be written that day it will come (laughs) its way into other you know like I will find myself like in the bathroom for four hours (laughs) and just like (laughs) you know, like this has to be written, you know, like, <laughs> so there's some time, there's something about saying yes. And I have shaped my whole life to be able to say yes to writing that wants to come through me. Um, and now it's like, no matter how nice my office is, I almost always spend the first three hours of my day laying in bed, writing on my phone. Mm-hmm. And like, I have to accept, I'm like, that's just how I like to write. I like to lay here. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been reading this book called Daily Rituals, Women at Work by Mason Curry that Mm -hmm. has really been an affirmation of that. It's like all kinds of women's creative process. Um, And I'm like, oh yeah, we like to write in the morning. Like creatives like to be able to create with the first energy of the day and not be distracted by anything else. And I'm like, that makes Mm -hmm. sense. And then the piece around being courageous um, feels important. So I feel like for a long time, I wanted my writing to be accepted and I wanted, I was still so concerned with being like likable and, uh, you know, something that people could be like, yeah, you know, we agree with what you've written here. And I feel like for the past few years, I've had to really lean into like what it means to be a courageous writer. And I have learned a lot. There's this Buddhist, um, you know, guideline for speaking, which is, is it necessary? Is it true? And is it kind? And I have found that that really, really helps with my writing because I can write stuff that's very true, but harsh and a harshness that's not necessary. I can write stuff that's very kind, totally unnecessary. I can write stuff that, you know, like, right, all that different stuff. So Mm. for me, the courage has been possible when I've slowed way down. Mm. And I used to write, when I first started my blog, I was like, so urgent. It was like, (gasps) this thing just happened, you know, and actually it was like when the war in Afghanistan and Iraq were starting, that was kind of where I was getting started. Cause I was like, I was writing first as emails and I would just be like, y'all, here's the perspective that we need to have urgently so we can stop this war. And it was like, so like, I can still feel that everything in my body was so tense. Like this writing had to be an intervention. Mm -hmm. And I think I've had to really slow down as I've recognized, like, that's not how interventions work especially Mm -hmm. ideological interventions it's really important that you're coherent and it's really important that that the piece is good (laughs) you know and that it's as long as it needs to be so I write much longer much slower for my courageous work and Mm -hmm. and I let other people read stuff before I publish it now which I also never used to do um but that helps with my courage too because I have people who I trust, you know, to be like, you know, is this courageous or is it, I don't ever want to be incendiary. I don't ever want to be like, you know, I'm just being controversial. Like I I really want it to be like, this is a necessary place where this, no one has said it quite like this, or if they have, it's ancestral and we need to make it current. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I love, 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 you know, but I'm like, ah, if I can take a breath and my shoulders are down and back and I dreamt about it and it keeps coming back, mm-hmm. um, then, then yeah, that's mine to write. And, and I need to not be scared to say whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I guess just, yeah. just like, oh, yeah. I would, I would add to that. Addendum. Yeah. Cause that's, that's so important. And that you have the people to have, to have feedback. And even if people don't have their community of feedback yet, yes. I think understanding that you can, you can pause, like you can, I write every day. A lot of that stuff, nobody ever sees it. You know, like that's that's not what it was for, you know? And so I think that sometimes the pressure of writing something that's going to be comprehensible and useful to other people can stop us before we even write whatever we need to write for that day. That's right. And sometimes the thing that, that does need to be shared requires me to actually sit with the thing and write about it for weeks and months and years before yeah so Mm. I think that just giving giving your writing that grace that it doesn't have to be a product it doesn't have to be a unit of exchange that's right it doesn't have Mm -hmm. to be anything 
That's right. It's just, it's just an opportunity for you to be present and you can have the process of discernment, whether that involves other people or, or whatever the processes are for, for each of us to see, okay, what of that That's is right. the necessary kind and true one other thing, true thing um, yeah. mm. to share. Yeah. Yeah. Writing mm. fiction is especially fun. It's being like, is this true? <laughs> it's not. A lot of, it a lot of fiction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anything to add there, Toshi? No, y'all got it. Satisfied. Um, there's a beautiful question here. What makes you will to survive the apocalypse? Uh, I, this person says, I struggle to envision a future where I'm safe because even my present self seeks refuge beyond the stars. Um, so yeah, what makes you will to survive the apocalypse? This one's from a Nicole Jordan. I don't know, man. I mean, my mom talked about death so much. Um, it started when I was like uh, 13 or 14 and I saw how hard my mom worked. Uh -huh. My mom like, you know, and she was, she was, um, she graduated. She brought me and my brother up to this, herself and with, you know, the support of community and family, but she was, we, you know, she just did, she did Sweet Honey in the Rock. And then she worked at Smithsonian Institute. She was just transformative everywhere. And then she, she did something else and she did something else. It, it's, it's a lot. And um, so I wrote her a letter and I said, mom, you know, I just want you to know I'm here to help you because I see you working really hard and I'm worried about you. Uh -huh. And then she told me she wakes up every day and she kind of has like a, a, a line and list of like what is before her and then she does as much as she can and what she doesn't do is between her and her god and she was like she she has no problem asking me for help when she wants it uh -huh. um but she said i should know that when she dies she will have lived the life she wanted to live and that she had intentionally woken up and decided a path in each day that she's lived her life. And that didn't mean she was in charge of the day. You know, it didn't mean that, that she was in charge of circumstances. It didn't mean everything was all right. It didn't mean, you know, that she thought she was getting on a plane and then, you know, her daughter fell down at the um, playground and busted her tooth and she had to take her to the dentist for seven years because she broke the same tooth seven times terrible you know it, it, you know it, it, every disruptions all over the place but that part about where she yeah. was like what doesn't happen is between me and my god really resonated with me at that age and i didn't think of it like the god that, that you know her father was a Baptist minister, but she never made us go to church or anything unless my grandma made us. And part of that was she said, well, when y'all figure out what spiritual practice you want, you should go and do it. Yeah. You know, so I think the idea of living and, 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 sur and you know, I almost don't even want to use the word surviving. I think the idea of living is is every day you wake up and you and you move through your day and then there's there's your day. That's right. And um and kind of if you can wake up and think about survival in a place of like, you know, here we are on a Zoom and we're you you're like in a you're in a different space yes. than most of the people on the planet. Like I think I think it's just important to understand that there's a level of 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 existing and creating in places in in ways that we I call apocalyptic now yes. but that people have been doing for decades that's right you know and that you know or centuries yes if you really think about it so that the so like i for this era and time like i am not thinking about like how am i going to survive an apocalyptic situation because i can't think 
in my mind of anything worse than being someplace where I'm loved by my family and somebody snatching me yeah. and putting me in a cave and then having me sit on a boat on an ocean surrounded mm-hmm. by sharks while they add more and more and more and more people and then sailing me across the big water plankton and chains. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I, 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 we, yes. have, we have been in the apocalypse, the human apocalypse on planet earth for a very long time. Yes. And what, what we're feeling right now is the planet um, adapting to yeah. our abuse yeah. and our apocalyptic nature. That's and true. that's the thing we can't do anything about. That's the thing that we have to surrender and, and come into practice yeah. with what the planet is telling us we need to do. And it takes us out, it takes us out of our violent, exploitive nature and into the way the species operate on the earth, every single other species on the planet yes. thinks about their living. They think about their living. They think about like they know to live near the thing they need to help them. They know I'm supposed to eat eucalyptus leaves. I need to be near a eucalyptus tree. I don't need to be somewhere where there isn't a eucalyptus tree and have leaves sent to me, you know? <laughs> Exactly. We, are the, we are out of line. We're the only species <laughs> on this planet that is out of line. It is just That's right. us. That's right. So when you think about your survival, what the fuck are you talking about? That's right. Like are you talking about surviving as we are? It's impossible. That's right. We have been failing at surviving. That's right. For such a long time, you know, yeah. and the planet by herself will take you out. That's right. Like when she needs to erupt the volcano, she will take you out. When it's time for her to create a desert, there will be no water. Like That's certain right. species will die. Like she will do these things because that is who she is in terms of herself. But we're the species that pushes everything to the extreme. And That's that we, you know, when people say death, human death cult, when people say le- like electing leaders, that are only concerned with like violence and death and like these really small ideas of pleasure that cause somebody else to be violated and that's harmed. Right. That's, that's, right. that's what we're talking. We can't survive that. That's right. We can't. That's what, that's what Earth Seed is about is that, you know, the simplest thing that she had the people say was, I won't steal from you. Yes. Like I won't kill you and that's I'll right. walk your back. That's right. That's it. It's not, you don't have to do a whole lot like to be in balance with your species and then be in balance with your earth, which you are literally a part of. Like we have rejected us uh, ourselves as beings like a tree, like we are 70% water. Like we are literally the planet and we're the only species that have said no. That's right. And we've just been on a journey and a practice to come back home. Mm-hmm. like that is we are trying to get home so it's not how can you survive like something that you should not want to survive something like this I'm like just land the thing on my head and let whatever happens happen you want to come back home you want mm-hmm. to find your practice it's everybody's won't be the same but how can you get home like That's what do you enough. have to do how can you yeah. find your community how um, can you find your people how are you personally in your own life? Like I cannot tell you living so far outside of that, that when you think about it, there is nothing. What do you have to do to change it? Like this, you are not in charge. This is why change, 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 change. Like, <laughs> you, got, you know, so, you know, she says the destiny of Earthseed is to live amongst the stars. And Adrian and I, and I'm sure Alexis and I have had this conversation. Mm-hmm. I'm like, we already are amongst the stars. We mm-hmm. do. <laughs> yeah. So we're already there. And what, she's, what she thought about was a, a, a destiny that involved pra- a practice. Yeah. So that if you had to like have a practice, the practice would bring people together. If our practice was to figure out how we could get to another place amongst the stars and then bring the best of us to that place and basically, you know, wonderfully colonize 
<laughs> you know, another planet. I'm not really sure how that works. <laughs> then, you know, but I, in my heart, I am like, how do we get back home? Right. Yeah. And if it's a matter of us flying in a ship and <laughs> coming back and landing, I'll do it. But how do we get back home? <laughs> that's right. How yeah. do we get back home? Like, how are we going to be home? Like, that's, that's really it. Like, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's all I got. You, know, you can't, <laughs> you can't. Don't give us a whole word and then say I that. know that was a whole don't service right there. Right there. <laughs> that's yeah. all I got. That was just. You cannot, so good. you cannot survive the state of humans on, on planet earth right now. You might stay alive. But the survival that you're uh, that right. I think people are talking about is uh, is actually like it's it's more like how can I be restorative? How can I like come back the other way? What how can I like don't run to how can I run with my head on fire? No, just fall down and die if that's the case. But right now, what right do now. you have? Like come into it, like you know, to bring your currency, bring your you know your abilities like it can be tiny tiny just bring it like that yes. you don't have to be like the most super spectacular anything you have to be yourself and like and like ready to walk through the door I'm knocking on the door I'm coming home like that's it yeah. to me Toshi I I love this I want um I know we're at time we're gonna go a little bit past it because I want to make sure we give space for Alexis to have a final word on this. And it feels like just important to me, the gift of having you here. Um, I just want to really affirm that aspect of like, and this is very recent for me, that I have been relinquishing my control of the future, my attempt to control the future. Um, you know, so much of my apocalyptic thinking has been like the future, the future, the future. And it's that piece of like, no, I'm just living in the present. And the present has, as always, its apocalyptic conditions. And as always, our ancestors and we are responsible for surviving our present, whatever our present contains, so that there is more, so that there's more present for more generations, you know, mm. in relationship to this planet. And that's it, right? To me, and I'm like, it's not a will. It's just, it's just like, this is what it is to be present in life. I wake up mm. and there is an earthquake in Haiti mm -hmm. and I am trying to figure out how to get people out of Afghanistan. And I am mm. praying over my friend's dad's house where a fire is closing in on it. And I am mm. praying that another friend whose daughter was attacked is able to get her home. And I am like, all of it's concurrent. Mm -hmm. Everyone I know has something personal that is apocalyptic. And then there's all these greater things. And I just have to be present in that and expand myself. How much of this can I hold and feel? How authentically can I offer my energy and my resources to it today? Is there anything else that needs to come through for this? And mm -hmm. tomorrow will come too. And I might be there and I'll offer what I have to it. And if not, you know, I hope I did well today. That piece mm -hmm. around being really intentional with the day, that's it for me, is I'm just like, get in this day, live mm -hmm. it well. Yeah. So Alexis, I wanted to come to you and see what you have on this, see what you have on anything else you want to say. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I really moved by the bravery of this particular question. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Because there's a question of how, how do we survive, but, but inside of it is, I can't imagine myself feeling safe in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because right now I'm, I'm paraphrasing the person's question, but yes. like projecting myself out into the stars, you know? And I think the level of, the level, the, this is one of the things that I, that I think that Octavia's work and especially this series asks us to think about. Yeah. Um, what does it mean to be present with change? Mm -hmm. When, uh, especially when dissociation is basically uh, what change makes us want to do. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because it because it triggers traumatic experiences and experiences where we weren't in control of the situation and we were harmed. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to be specific about how brave it is to name that. And the 
the incredible thing. I mean, like, I don't know if I could have imagined being right here where I am right now, right. before now, right? And there's echoing what Toshi and Adrian have said. I did survive the apocalypse. Yes. I did. And then I do, you know, like that, like that's the, we are, that's the on, we, we are. And I think that it's important to remember that apocalypse, the end of the world is not one thing, is not one event. Yes. And as somebody healing and as, as a survivor, it's very linked to me remembering that what I'm facing in this moment is not the same thing as my greatest fear happening again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think this the kind of like unity of there's gonna be one apocalypse and then everything changes, everything's over is related to what it is for a whole traumatized population, like the, our whole species yes. to be feeling that we're always waiting for our greatest fear in this moment, we're blocked from this moment because we're projecting our greatest fear yes. onto it again. Mm -hmm. And so the dissociation, like I really wanna be out in the stars. I mean, I'm looking at the stars all the time. I'm fascinated, I'm interested. You know, I feel like I'm space traveling and time traveling. <laughs> all the time. All the time. Um, and what Toshi said, you know, the absurdity, like you gonna mail me a eucalyptus leaf, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That is the materialization of that dissociation. That's right. So we're living in a structure that is dissociation, right? That's, that's what capitalism is. It says everything is separate. Yes. And that separation is safety. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm just here to say it's a lie. It's a lie. Octavia knew it was a lie. A Octavia lie. wrote this whole thing to shame the devil. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a lie. Yes. That we're not separate and mm -hmm. we are entangled and mm -hmm. this moment is this moment is not the same as it was because god has changed mm -hmm. yes it's always mm -hmm. a joy 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 to be amongst preachers mm -hmm. um, to be amongst those who just give the word channel and allow it to come through um i want to offer for all of us to just take in a deep breath Celebrate your mycelial nature, okay? I don't know if you feel it, but I can feel the connectivity. I feel the threads yeah. between us and all the life pulsing amongst them and the messages and it's pulsing amongst all the people who've been with us throughout this conversation. Yeah, uh, It will pulse into the future. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Again, we're gonna take the audio from this and put it onto the Octavius Parables feed. There'll be a transcript with that and we're also going to post the video onto probably youtube or something um we are so grateful that you spent all this time with us you asked amazing questions yeah. alexis thank you so much for being willing to join us and this conversation now we oh, feel completion <laughs> like i'm like no. this, you did this, it you did this it was just right and <laughs> we gotta crazy. do it again though <laughs> well i want to keep doing this forever so the next forever. book is Bosky, so just yeah be ready. which is my number um, one favorite all-time activity i mean it's ever. the number one right i was like oh, the parables goodness. you get through the parables and then wild seed is the joyful explosion yes. of healing mystery the interspecies come on <laughs> interspecies love stories oh. um <laughs> i also want to say toshi thank you for saying yes to doing this project um, oh my god the best it's, yes it's such a good yes i feel like uh, we're all learning so much because of the yeses of our lives so thank mm. you all yeah. love you all love you have a great yeah. rest of your day yeah. ah. <laughs> bye bye, bye. Let's see how do i end this